one of the ingredients. Oh, sorry, something happened here. Uh, that was me forgetting to have started the recording. Sorry. <laughs> I have to. Uh, I have to stop the share. What? What? what okay. No, you can. You can carry on. I apologize okay. to interrupt. Okay. So uh, no, it's okay. So um, after after Huygens' uh, research on collisions, there was this course by Gustav Gaspar Coriolis, uh, L'Ecole Polytechnique, where he was discussing classical mechanics, rational mechanics as they called it, and they were looking into these effects that you can impose on the on the on the balls, and it's it seems like a really nice course. Uh, it seems that they had a table next to them and they were having a lot of fun. So uh, that's uh, where analysis starts to come in, in the study of collisions. In the 20th century, ergodic theory, uh, with the work from Jacob Sinai uh, about uh, collisions with elastic, uh, dynamic uh, dynamical system with elastic collisions, uh, this is a very seminal paper from 1970, uh, inspired a sequence of works on, on stochastic, on, on stochastic features, no, sorry, on billiards. There, I think, I'm not a specialist in the area, I don't know very much actually, but what I think they are looking at is the evolution of a region with the, the, what the flow does to a certain volume, element of volume. Will it cover the whole table? How, how, what type of invariant uh, behaviors we expect to see? And what is the long-term behavior of the, of the process? So <clears throat> this, uh, this these billiards they give a very nice example of folding maps and a rich amount of uh, geometry, a rich connection with a lot of mathematics, and it has been the choice by Kozlov and Treshev to make a course on dynamical system based on billiards. At the same year, there was this uh, shake and bake algorithm by Romain. And uh, what they're, they are doing here is something with a bit more applied flavor. They are sampling points from the boundary of a region uh, by throwing a lot of particles and letting them adhere to the boundary of a convex region. And with that, they can distinguish which are the active uh, restrictions for a convex optimization problem, right? You have a convex region, an uh, intersection of hyperplanes, and you allow your particle to allow, to tell you what are the active regions you're looking into. But truth be told, what we're really looking at and what makes uh, our work, what motivates our work is the study of non-homogeneous random walks, which is a topic that's uh, very well developed in Durham. Uh, I wanna say first that there is this pair of works by Nicholas Georgiou and Andrew Wade and by Hugo Lowe and Andrew Wade again, on the half strip model, uh, they, I, I spoke in the, in the introduction that we will see a translation with respect to the half strip model. And that's actually because there was, it's also based on a, another earlier work. So 2008 from 2018, in 10 years, uh, this work is by Menchikov, Marina Vashkovskaya and Andrew Wade. So what they see here is that they classified a non-homogeneous random walk in the table that's this type of regions. So we had stochastic billiards with IAD reflections. And later in 2018, it became clear that we could translate this problem into the context of half strip model and making a few adjustments, we would be able to classify stochastic billiards with a more general type of reflection. So actually uh, here I have told you already everything that we're doing, but I wanna tell it again because uh, I want to define the model with, uh, in, with patience and time. So what, what's the region we're looking at? So <clears throat> this is the curved uh, conic or the generalized uh, parabolic domain. So if gamma here is equal to one half, that's a parabola that we rotate. And if gamma is one, we cannot have gamma equals one, right? Uh, but that would be a cone. <clears throat> That's the region where we are examining our billiard, the, 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 our, our stochastic billiards. So the particle here moves linearly inside the table, and when it reaches the boundary, it reflects uh, according to a Markovian kernel. So this is what's uh, 
how we construct. We fixed we fix a point Z in the boundary of the region and an incoming angle. And based on this incoming angle, we sample an outgoing angle. And once this is done, well, so this is the kernel here. This is the notation we're going to be using. The kernel here depends on alpha and is sampled according to uh, a certain distribution, right? So uh, once we know the outgoing angle, we can determine the next uh, boundary point. And from the embedded process, we determine the trajectory of, of the billiard, right? Because it moves in as a ray and in a line from line to line. And once we have uh, all the, the next incoming, the next boundary point, we also determine the next incoming angle. I wrote here this formula. It doesn't have to, it doesn't make sense now, but in a few, in a few moments it will. I want to explain this in a bit more detail, how we determine the next incoming angle. So let's, uh, fix a point in the boundary, just concentrate on the upper half. The problem is entirely symmetric about the, the X axis. So we may concentrate on the upper half plane. And we have this angle with respect to the vertical, that's the theta Z, which also appears here, right? We have theta Z is the angle with respect to the vertical. And the outgoing angle is this alpha with this arrow pointing upwards. It's represented here in blue. So if we have that, we may, try, we, may, we may get the ray and see what's the next collision point, Z plus. To compute this exactly, it's not immediate because the region is not so easy to work out. But um, we can approximate this value. And But in principle, it's a single point, so that's the the point of the definition. And the next incoming angle is actually a function of the angles with respect to the normal. So we can see here how theta Z plus and theta Z enter the game. What's important is that as Z goes to infinity, theta Z uh, goes to zero. So it's the outgoing angle is almost the income, the next incoming angle. So that's, uh, that's something that to keep in mind. Okay, <clears throat> so what's the result? If we have a short notation for the single step of the reflection kernel, we may define a critical value gamma c, which is uh, the which is given by this formula, right? We have replaced f here by the tangent squared. It will become clear why the tangent appears in this type of problems. But now we can note that this is less than one half because it's of the form x divided by one plus two x, right? And x is always larger than zero because it's a tangent squared. So, so we have gamma critical is less than one half. And what is this gamma critical telling us? It's telling that if our region has a gamma larger than the gamma critical, we're transient, and if it's below, it's no recurrent. So uh, a way to remember this is that the cone, I'm trying to draw the cone here. So uh, if we're in the cone, there is an entire region that if we reflect, we'll get lost at infinity. So this, this has to be transient, right? And if it's parallel, or when gamma equals when gamma equals zero, these are parallel lines. So this is gamma equal one, and this is gamma equal zero. So if it's gamma equal zero, this condition here is telling us that the drift, the average drift, is zero, which tells us that we are we have a no recurrent random walk. The intermediate region, which is that we're looking gamma between zero and one uh, should move from the recurrent to the transient. So the, the, smaller, the smaller the gamma, uh, the more recurrent it is. That's because uh, the normal uh, gives a slight drift away of the origin, right? When, it, when it's inclined, the more it goes against the vertical line, it's pushing the angle 
uh, to the right. It's put, making the displacement uh, go more to the right. So that's the intuition. And the rest of the talk is devoted to explaining this result from, uh, from a more formal perspective, right? Give, giving a full argument for that. At least the main ideas. All right. So uh, we enter the second phase, trying to talk about some heuristics. And to sum up, that's the image to remember. We, are, we have a function here, which is our Lyapunov function, which is uh, something that indicates the long-term behavior of our system. If the function goes down, it is transient. We have to think of this as a half region. So there's a barrier here. And if the function diverges to infinity, then it is recurrent. So this is actually an if and only if statement provided a few uh, regularity assumptions. And I want to tell you, give a few ideas of why this is so. Maybe uh, uh, I think that's what I remember, the way I remember these things. So uh, it's not just any function that we are looking into here. We're looking into super martingales that what's, uh, will give us a definite uh, description of what was happening with the average of our process. Because this is a probabilistic model, the particle may go against uh, the slope of the function. So, But on average, we know the average is decreasing. And because the average is decreasing, the long-term behavior of each particle uh, is also uh, possible. We are also able to determine uh, what's happening to them. So let me tell you uh, that this, you, you might know already, but let me repeat. This is an if and only if statement. If it is transient, we, are, we will be able to find uh, a Lyapunov function that decreases. And here is an example, quite unforgettable example of the Lyapunov function is the probability of reaching the origin uh, ever, reaching the origin if we start from I. Because it's, uh, it is transient, the limit as i goes to infinity tends to zero. And this is a super martingale. At zero, it's not a martingale. But since at zero, the value is one, a step will decrease the, the average. That's when the average is decreasing, is when it visits zero. And as the average decreases, uh, it means that the particles might, must also be going to the lower regions of the function. So we can deduce its uh, transients. So, uh, but it's clear that if we start from a transient random walk, we produce a super martingale that decreases at infinity. For the recurrent case, uh, we look at a bit more complicated uh, function, but still based on stopping times. So what this function phi and j is telling is the probability of ever visiting uh, n or above of visiting n or above before visiting uh, the origin, starting from j, right? So note first that if j is larger than n, this number is one, because we started already from the region that's above n. And as n goes to infinity, because this is uh, a recurrent, it will visit the origin. And it's unlikely that it will visit a very distant region before visiting the origin. So as n goes to infinity, this goes to zero. And based on this, with the, on, based on this property, we construct a sequence of, of n's and k's that go to, to infinity so fast that ensure a decrease on the value of this phi for j less than k. This allows us to construct a function that is uh, less than i plus one, remember that this is less than one. And this function being finite in a sum of super martingales uh, is a good candidate for our, it is actually the function that will diverge to infinity. The reason it diverges is that as i goes to infinity, these numbers start to be one. We have a lot of ones in the beginning. And it's not that we are going to have the i from the first i terms, but something like that, at least for the first few, you have close to one. So um, that's the idea 
of seeing the equivalence between uh, these Lyapunov functions and the classification of occurrence and transients. Uh, what we're looking for is uh, what's happening at, with a function at infinity, if it's going to, if it's growing up or if it's decreasing. Okay. <clears throat> so let me tell you now how we translate stochastic billiards into half strip models. Let's start with the parallel, uh, two parallel lines and think of a stochastic kernel like we described. We have an incoming angle and from that angle we sample a with another outgoing angle, which will be equal the next incoming angle, right? I have chosen here to trace this angle here. So uh, we may uh, relate this model to a half strip just by keeping track of the x coordinate, we don't need to worry so much about the y coordinate and the angle, the incoming angle, which is equal, yeah. And it's not equal to the outgoing angle, but it's, the, it's what's going to regulate the outgoing angle. So what I drawn here is two different uh, reflections based roughly on this image here. You may see that if we have an outgoing angle alpha from a certain point, the displacement we have is proportional to the tangent of alpha. And that's why the tangent appears as an important quantity for telling us what's happening with the displacement. So we may translate this homogeneous random walk into an homogeneous random walk on the half strip. So this homogeneous stochastic period becomes an homogeneous half strip and if we have a curved region, which is a perturbation of this, of this problem, the translation still holds, but will not have a, a homogeneous random walk on the half strip, but it will be, but it will be uh, non-homogeneous. So that's how we, we connect stochastic videos in half strip. And from now on, I'll be just working with the notation for the half strip which is more compact and, and more insightful. So uh, before I enter the non-homogeneous half strip model, let me, oh, sorry. Let me um, say a few words about uh, the, the half strip in a non-homogeneous case, which may appeal to people that have um, familiarity with economics. Imagine we have a, a betting system. That is, uh, we, we are going to bet on a certain thing we have a profit or a loss, and uh, this the, our profit is based on the outcome of the of the environment, the scenario, the economic scenario we have. So I have I'm calling these different scenarios here by eta, and this is modulating our our wealth, the evolution of our wealth. So x here is how our wealth. And the dynamics we have is a function of independent random variables, u and v. And the, the profit we make or the loss we have doesn't depend on our wealth. It only depends on the environment. So if we're talking about such an homogeneous wall, this is very homogeneous, uh, we can investigate what's the expected profit we'll have. That I think that would be an interesting question for someone looking at this type of problem. And uh, it turns out that because we're assuming that the environment evolves in a Markovian way, we have convergence of the environment to the, to the invariant measure. And then uh, our expected profit will converge to uh, this value here, delta star, which is uh, given by the formula here. Uh, we have the profit from Delta one here, that's because this doesn't depend really on n. So this is equal to the expected value of delta one, given that eta one is i. So as a function really only of eta. And we are going through it with the invariant measure pi. So if we do this, we have actually transformed the half strip model into a half line. And we're looking at an equivalent walk which is actually what's governing our expected behavior. So if delta star is positive, uh, you, you are making profit 
and this is a transient walk. And if it's negative, you, you're, you're going to visit the origin. And just so that the walk is not, is not uh, reducible, that we get trapped in the origin, let's just say that if you lose everything, a, gentle, uh, a kind soul gives you one pound to restart uh, your betting and you can uh, escape uh, being trapped, uh, broke. So uh, this will be a recurrent walk in case delta is negative. So that's the idea. We simplify very much what's happening by looking at uh, the effect and looking at the value of the invariant measure in the environment. So uh, now let's have a look at our non-homogeneous walk with a transition kernel that depends on the position of x and, and, and not uh, yeah, on x and alpha, both. So we're trying to build a chain, a Markov chain on R plus cross uh, times S and S here is a is the you know is an interval i'm thinking of this as pi over 2 minus pi over 2 because these are the angles but you could think of any compact set uh this could be oh let me put a one here this could be zero one uh we'll, we'll, it's okay it's better even to think about pi over 2 and minus pi over 2 like a compact set right the transition kernel we have is uh dependent on X and alpha, but as we saw, X doesn't play a, a, a doesn't play a uniform role, and it's actually not playing much of a role if we approach infinity. So I want to say a few words about how it behaves near infinity. We have this almost Markovian condition in our in our uh, kernel. Uh, as X goes to infinity, or is larger a certain value here, I'm just considering large values of x, this distance in total variation tends to zero. That's the assumption we need to make to work with the half strict model. But from the uh, computations we make on the stochastic billiard, we actually have a first order approximation of this, of this kernel. We can find a measure uh, and see the rate of convergence at rate one over x. So, <clears throat> So we, we have a good idea of what's going on between the kernel at point X and the, and the reflection kernel in parallel lines or in the infinity, right? And right, so this is a bit of geometry. And we want to collect also the invariant measure because this will play a role in the type of gain or its net value of our increment. So we need to keep an eye on the environment measure, which is a measure uh, that's, that's preserved by the single step of our kernel at infinity. So this S here stands for strip, but actually at infinity, we have the KB we were talking about. So uh, the context we're in here is what we call the Lamperti regime. We're trying to determine the long-term behavior of our problem based on first and second moment conditions. This is a recurrent theme in probability, even study of diffusions is uh, based on first and second moments. So uh, that's uh, the idea that we're looking for here. And we are in an almost homogeneous case, meaning that the drift here, D stands for drift, and E is the letter that comes after D, is the first order approximation of the drift. So the drift is almost constant, given by D alpha, but has a perturbation E alpha. Alpha is the angle that we are considering. And the variance is also well approximated here, S stands for standard deviation. We also have a good approximation on the variance of our increment. And these functions, we assume they are continuous. And because S is compact, these are continuous and bounded. We may remember at, at this stage, what is the overall drift? Delta one is the integral with respect to the invariant measure. And this will tell us what's happening with the walk. If it's positive, we'll have transients, will be ballistic. And if it's negative, it will be positive recurrent. So the Lamperti regime 
is uh, the case when delta one equals zero. That's the critical case in a sense, because just a little above or a little below, we're going from transient to recurrent or recurrent to transient. We're going to study here what's called the strict Lamperti regime when we impose that each d alpha is zero. It's, I think it's easy to see that if each d alpha is zero, delta one will be zero. So it seems like a big loss, but actually a good understanding of the strict Lamperti regime allows us to deal with the general Lamperti case. But for the purpose of this talk, I just want to concentrate on the strict Lamperti regime. And now uh, we're ready to have a look at the Lyapunov functions. So the type of functions we're looking at, they have some sort of uh, penalty functions phi or price functions phi. If we had taken new equals two, just imagine for a second the new equals two, what we're doing is a horizontal translation on each line. And ideally what we want to do is we want to have a price for going to a bad environment. It's like a, maybe <clears throat> a, a way of ensuring yourself from the worst, from, from the bad scenarios if we were thinking about the betting system that I mentioned earlier. So uh, this phi, this penalty function, this horizontal translations in a way, uh, uh, are, appear in the study of half strip homogeneous problems. And it's what inspires us to look at this type of functions for our case. So we actually add this flexibility, which is having a power new, different than, different than two. And as we'll see, we'll be, it will be important that we tune this to get the definite result. The idea is to make a Taylor expansion and use the uh, almost uh, homogeneous uh, properties of our drift and variance to replace the increment by a function that's depending on the first order approximation of the drift. Remember that we are assuming that d alpha equals zero, so that's why it does not appear. Uh, so we have the, the first order approximation of the drift, the variance term. We have a strange, a scary function of the reflection kernel at infinity. We have a correction term here also that depends on new. Don't worry so much about this. And this term here is an error term. What's important about it is that it vanishes. So we're basically looking at these first three terms. And we're trying to get a definite sign inside this parenthesis to assign, to decide uh, how to choose new in order to build a super Martin unit. So let me uh, pause for a moment and recall what we're looking at here. Uh, we're trying to solve an operator problem, trying to get, we have a certain function that we're trying to reach, which is, uh, 2e alpha minus s alpha squared. So we're trying to get this value. And this is a problem of uh, solving a kind of vector system, infinite dimensional vector system or linear system of equations uh, that, that we're looking for the existence of a function phi that will reach this value. And the theory for the existence of sol solutions is a combination of linear algebra and functional analysis that uh, is called Fredham alternative. So basically what we're looking here is a compact operator that acts on the space of functions like this. It takes uh, function f to a function g and the value at alpha is given by the integral with respect to the kernel at alpha of the function the adjoint of this operator is the single step dynamics in the space of measures. So we start from a measure mu and we go to a measure nu, which is distributed as what happened the next, what's the distribution of this in, with the initial condition mu following the kernel k. So, uh, all right. The Fredholm alternative states that the, the co orthogonal complement of the kernel of the adjoint is uh, equal to the range of our operator. And if you remember here for a second, T of phi at alpha is the integral of phi beta K 
ks alpha d beta. If we subtract the identity, we have d minus i phi alpha is equal to the integral phi beta minus phi alpha, which is exactly what we are looking for here. Ks alpha d beta. Right. <clears throat> so to give an idea uh, from a more, from a matricial perspective, that's how I remember the Fredholm alternative. If we have a self-adjoint operator, that's diagonal, the range, which is written here as all the vectors that do not have the component, the first component here, right? So it's the orthogonal complement of, let me put here a one and zero, 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 zero. And if you want a bit more general image, uh, that's uh, the range of T is the, ortho is the orthogonal complement of the kernel of the operator T star. All right, how do we use this to get a notion of the sign inside this parenthesis? So first, what we do is that we integrate this term 2E alpha minus S alpha squared, call it delta R, and we're assuming here this is not zero, okay? So <clears throat> now we subtract this value from the target value that we're target vector 2E alpha minus S alpha squared, so that when we integrate this, uh, we have that it is zero. And if this integral is zero, this means that psi is orthogonal to pi, the invariant measure, which is the base for the kernel of the adjoint, if we subtract the identity, right? Because we have t star of the invariant measure is the invariant measure. That's actually the definition of the invariant measure. Right, so uh, this is a one dimensional space because we're assuming that our kernel is ergodic. I, I had to mention that, let me mention this now. So uh, for this reason, we know that psi is in the, is in the range of T minus I, and that being the case, uh, we can achieve the function minus psi with, uh, because if psi is in the range, it's a vector space, we can, have psi and minus psi. So if we get here, subtract minus the r and add delta r, what we have done here is that we are able to find a function phi that will kill this term for us. We don't know what phi is, but we know it's doing the job. And it's actually giving us a certain space, which is this delta r, that will allow us to get the sign of our function and decide what type of super martingale we're looking at. So we are approaching the end. This is the last slide. Uh, let me recall, that's the term we're trying to examine. Uh, the Lyapunov function we're looking at has this uh, form. We can find a solution to this problem. Now this psi here, I have already inverted the sign. But it's such that when we look at the increment of the Lyapunov function, we have delta r plus nu s alpha plus an error term. So now is the moment where we're going to say, take nu very small so that uh, the sign inside this parenthesis is determined by delta r. So if delta r is positive, if this is positive, I choose nu negative. And how does my Lyapunov function looks with nu is negative is decreasing. This means uh, the walk is transient. If delta is negative, you might already be guessing, I will take nu positive so that this goes to infinity. And with this, we completed our classification. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Conrado.